Okay, um, so our first speaker of the day was kind of introduced already yesterday. He um, got his PhD in computational chemistry at the University of Bath, and he's now postdoctoral scholar at MIT. He's going to talk about today uh, a little bit about how how do you perform a good experiment. So please give a warm welcome to Mr. Chris Henderson. All right, I'm going to try and not do what Maxwell did and shove the microphone in my chin. Uh, so, so I've been in coffee for three years. Uh, I got into this because I met Max in his store. And I, when I was living in Bath, I was looking for a good coffee, and I just happened to have a shop that was OK around the corner. Uh, so my experience is very much from, I, I would suppose, a, a high end, right? It's, it's all, every shot I've ever had when I was living there was weighed, OK? And a lot of people come from a very different perspective in coffee and started with something that they really didn't like and then explored upwards. So it's, it's very different from my perspective. But my background is uh, a chemist. So I moved, I was born in Colorado. I moved to Australia where I did my undergraduate, then I moved to England and did a PhD, and then I've just moved to MIT, which is in Boston. And uh, it's tradition in scientific presentations to introduce where you come from scientifically. So can we get the lights down a tiny bit, perhaps? Maybe it's not possible. No? You don't know how. OK. We shall carry on. Uh, Anyway, okay, so Boston, so I'm li I, I feel very privileged to be at MIT because I came from a very small place in Bath where a lot of people either, you're in London if you're in the UK or you're not. There's nothing else. So MIT is quite the opposite. MIT is a very famous place uh, and apparently it's ranked number one university in the world. Now, I don't know if that's true because I've been there and the people there, they're smart, but they're not that smart. I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> the... Uh, my office is right here. So it's in a pretty nice place. So this is like that front view of MIT. The chemistry building is this. So I, I sit right there. Uh, and I didn't know this when I got to MIT. I didn't know how famous this place was. But they've got a few inventions that people are familiar with. So uh, MIT invented the internet. Uh, also email, transistor radio, oil refining, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, Human Genome Project. Uh, a lot of things, and I, I simply work in water and coffee and physics. So I don't think my accolades can stand up to, for instance, oil ref Yeah, no, yeah, number nine is uh, water for cut. No, it's not. Okay, um, <laughs> so, okay. so today, today the, the purpose of this talk today is to, I suppose, explore how I think about problems as a scientist and maybe share some of the, the mentality that I have when I approach coffee problems with you. To help you in your shop, for instance, you have a bad a shot of espresso and you want to make it better, but you don't know where to start. Or if it's something much more fundamental, like you're trying to develop a new product and you have no idea where to start with that. That's the idea of this. You can ch channel some of the principles applied in this talk to that. Uh, and it's going to be broken down into uh, essentially four pieces. So learning to ask a good question, uh, determining the variables, which is very important, uh, followed by a design and execution of experiment, which I won't talk too much on because you guys are the experts in experimental uh, stuff, and then an analysis of data, which is my favorite part. Uh, I want to start with the learning to ask a good question. And I'll, I'm going to go to the next slide, but I'll tell you a story before we go through this. That when I started in coffee, I actually met Maxwell right before the WBC, or he'd just come back from the WBC the year before Rimini. Where was that? Was it in Austria? No. Yeah, you didn't get there. Right, right. OK, that's. <laughs> but you did when I showed up. It's all right. Uh, the, uh, no, the, um, what happened was I I'd got there, and I'd, Max had explained to me throughout the years that there's this coffee competition. And me being the worst sort of customer in the world, I'm, I'm, I walk into the shop, and I go, I know coffee. I'm from Australia, right? And I know nothing about coffee. I just say this because this is what I think. You know, I, I don't know anything. And I asked him, why can't you just simply compete with Starbucks roasted coffee in the barista competition? And the answer is you very well could, right? It's coffee. That's not forbidden in this competition whatsoever. But I didn't even know enough at the time to even ask a question of what, you know, wh which country was that coffee from. I didn't know anything about coffee. So I, I, you think you do, but you don't. And then as I get more educated, I learn to ask a good question. And this is really important in coffee because you need to learn to ask a question about 
uh, trying to elucidate what you want to figure out. So if you're having a problem with your grinder, for instance, is it making your shot run too slow or is it making it run too fast? What is the origin of this problem? That's a good question, right? What is the origin of this problem? What is a bad question would be something along the lines of, I think it's my grinder, maybe it's my espresso machine, maybe it's the coffee, let's just try and do something totally different. I don't know what's going on, let me consult a friend or something. That's not a good way of posing that question. You'd be better off narrowing down. Uh, you also want to know what you're trying to figure out and why you're, uh, why you're trying to do this. So this is very closely linked to the last one, uh, but why are you trying to solve a problem, or are you trying to create problems for someone, which is what I like to do, but uh, why are you trying to solve this problem? Is it because you're going to benefit your product? Is it because you're going to learn something for yourself, and, or you're going to be able to teach somebody? Or is it, moreover, actually very importantly, that perhaps you're going to try and prove somebody wrong? Right? And that's very important, because disproval of uh, currently accepted, we're good? It's not a fire alarm, is it? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're trying to figure. What we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out why we're doing this. Uh, finally, does the question have an answer? So, if I sit here and, I, and someone asks me, "Where am I from?" and I've just told you that I've moved all over the world, that's a very hard question for me to answer, right? So that's not a good question to answer. But if the question has a yes or a no or something tangible, that's a good question to ask. So is, is this extraction 21% or is it 21.5%? That's a good question, right? Finally, do we have the ability to answer it? Now, cost is really important. So I have access to equipment that you guys don't necessarily have access to. It's not mine. I just I can go and use it. But similarly, I don't have access to an EK43 if I want to go grind something. So I have to get in touch with somebody else. So it's, it's very expensive if I had to go and buy these things. And it's ex expensive for you if you had to come and you know, pay for the equipment that we use. So collaboration is important. And it's, a, it's very important to know when to seek outside help with a problem, okay? So determining uh, dependent and independent variables. I think this is overlooked a lot in coffee. This is a really, really important part. That a, an independent variable is something that you can physically change and observe a direct effect or perhaps no effect in response to it. And what I mean by this is, for instance, in the ideal world, I, I spent a long time on these, by the way. So the, you know, I, they actually did take longer than they should have because I wrote, I didn't rotate the canvas. I wrote this upward. Anyway, um, the, uh, in an ideal world, your espresso machine's pump pressure should be more or less constant over time. Now, we all know that that's not true. If you just start pumping water through it forever, it's, you're going to see a decrease in pressure. Uh, but more or less, th those things are mutually exclusive. So time should be exclusive from pump pressure. That's, in principle, that's what should be happening. So these are not really an, an important correlation to draw here, OK? But the next thing, we could be uh, percentage extracted uh, with time. Now, that's assuming that the pump pressure stays the same and everything else is the same. So the mass of coffee, the, the size of the, the coffee bed, everything else is the same. The grind profile is the same. You could say, OK, so extraction goes up with time. And whatever this curve looks like, I, you know, I just guessed. But whatever this looks like is effectively you can fit some sort of function to this, and you can start to understand how time affects your percentage of extraction. Uh, this is pump pressure versus percentage of extraction uh, with const uh, constant, yeah, indeed, very well. Uh, uh, percentage extraction with pump pressure. So as, uh, as your percentage of extraction goes uh, up with pump pressure as it decreases, so that makes water flowing through the bed much more slowly. So it has much more time to interact with the coffee, so you're, you get a higher extraction if you just rush that water through. Now, this isn't always strictly true, right? And I know that a lot of people here are thinking about this, and those things that I'm saying right there, and that you're thinking about that, that's the decoupling of an independent versus dependent variable. And that is why this right here is a bad example. This is not a good experiment to do. Okay, there's a lot of other things that contribute to the percentage extracted and pump pressure. Because constant time is a tricky one because it's a nonlinear relationship, so you have, to, you have to fit it yourself and see what you can learn from that, but it's probably not a useful exercise. Finally, uh, we've got two more. Uh, enjoyment versus percentage extracted. I think Scott's going to speak a little bit on, uh, well, perhaps something along the lines of this, uh, that there's a region where coffee tastes good, and outside of these regions, it doesn't taste so good. But that changes for every coffee, so it's very hard to understand what these, this percentage extraction means on an absolute scale. It's only on a relative scale versus people's enjoyment, well, that's, uh, that's pretty much impossible to quantify. So that's not so great either. Finally, 
Uh, water temperature versus solubility. Now, everything in coffee more or less increases in solubility with higher temperature of water. That's kinetic energy transfer, that's what it is. This is a really good experiment. You increase the temperature of the water, your solubili solubility goes up to a certain point. And that point is well defined because at some point water boils and it's no longer water, right? So that's, that is sort of a limitation. You can do a steam distillation if you like. So you get the idea, you're starting to think, okay, I'm gonna go and test something. There's dependent and independent variables and if I wanna do a good test to get a good data set, I need to isolate one independent variable and modulate it so that I can see its effect. And then I can start to draw some causation effects from this. And that's very important because in coffee, and in particular grinder science, which I know that Christian's speaking about today, we're gonna go into a little bit about why this is so important for understanding extraction. Uh, so design and execute the experiment. Um, this, is, this is quite challenging because I'm a theoretical chemist, so I very infrequently actually touch things. I do everything on a computer, so it's very important to have people like you, you guys, Maxwell is the one I work with and, you know, very closely, who actually touches things and knows what's really happening. You know, it's, it's great for me to say your espresso machine is going to pump this much water through in this much time, but on a particular day it may not do that, so who knows. Uh, and you want to ha have some perspective. So what you're trying to do is trying to achieve a grand goal, whatever this goal may be, it doesn't really matter. And the problem is that you can't ever test directly the big thing. You have to do incremental tests because if you go for the big thing, you will almost certainly have included more dependent variables than you would have thought. So usually, if you get an amazing shot, I think, what's this concept, the God shot, where you have a mag like the best shot you can possibly make with that espresso, right? And it's, a, it's the culmination of all possible variables coming together to make something really great. In that sentence itself is bad news. Right? You don't want all these variables coming together. You want to know what each variable did to make that good so that you can do it the same every single time. And that's really tricky because it means that your big goal is actually needs to be segmented into small goals incrementally so that you can solve each point. Okay, so we're, we're almost to the part where I like this. Yeah, here we go. So analyzing data. That when you get a data set, the data doesn't really care about your opinion, right? If I work for a big roastery and it I get this amazing tasting coffee and you have some way of quantifying how wonderful it is, the data will always look better to you than it does to your competitor roaster. Right? He's going to find or she's going to find some problem with your, this data that you've got to make you look worse. And the data really doesn't care. And in particular in science, scientists don't care about each other, they just care about whether they're presenting rigorous and well thought out data sets. And that's what I think when I look in the coffee industry, I like to come in and analyze people's data and try and make everything better. Right? I want everybody to have the right interpretation of data. It's not my interpretation, it's just analyzing it to its full extent. So you can definitely see what you want in your own data. Now I wanna, I wanna do an experiment now with you guys. Okay, here's what's gonna happen. It's called the birthday paradox. Okay, and the, there's two assumptions before we start. The first assumption is that all birthdays in the year, in the calendar year, besides, of course, February 29th, all birthdays are more or less equal, equally probable of occurring. Now, that's strictly not true because September 1st is nine months, or early September is nine months after New Year's Eve, and, you know, so the, I also am banking on the fact that in this experiment, you're gonna tell the truth. I think it's a fair assumption, but you have to consider that as well. So here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna start here, and you're gonna say very loudly, the day and the month of your birthday. Okay, and then you're gonna go to the next, and then the next, and the next, and so on, okay? And everybody needs to listen very clearly, because at the point in which your birthday has already been said, you say, my birthday has already been said. And that's where we stop, okay? So in principle, in this room, I look around, there's about 100 people in here, maybe, maybe a little more. So there's 366 days if you count February 29th, so this should, we should be able to, in principle, get all the way around the room. All right, so, <laughs> oh no, oh no. <laughs> So, so you get it? So for instance, I would say, okay, I'll start it. I'm, I'm gonna go for, uh, we can go October 1 or 1st of October, if you like. Already. It's done already. How many, how many people we get into here? So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So. Does this mean, from my data set, I mean, do you want to do it again? Because that's a pretty un improbable thing. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it's, we're going to get into it. I know you're getting excited. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do it one more time just to make sure that not one in eight people are born on which day? September 3rd. Yeah. Okay. We're going to do it one more time. Go ahead. Twenty eighth of November. Hold on. <laughs> this sometimes happens too when you do experiments. There's some uh, anomalous result where all of a sudden the result just falls out. Of, you know. Anyway, carry on. Let's see if we can get to it before Tibor speaks. Okay. There's always two. There's <laughs> okay, the point was, yeah, I, I understand, man. We're going to get to you if we get all the way back to you. <laughs> but, okay, let's just keep going. We're going to get, I, I'm banking that we're going to get to here. Go ahead. Already been said. No, it stops now. It's done. <laughs> So it's 1 in 8 to here, 1 in 15 to there, okay? Why does, so this is mean, let's say we'll take an average of that. We're going to go for 1 in 10 to make it really easy. So does that mean that 1 in 10 people in this room have a, the same birthday? So is there 1 in 10 days, or 1 in 10, yeah, so what's that? 10% of people in the whole world have the same birthday. No, not at all. But from this data set, yes, right? Why is that the case? So, so two, yeah, okay, so two people have the same birthday, right? It's, uh, it's tricky stuff. So actually, as it turns out, that if you do it with 23 people in a line, you have a 50% probability of getting two people to say the same answer. If you do it with 70 people, it becomes 99.9%. .9 and the reason for that is, is that for the first person, they say a, a day, like I did. And the second person has, uh, you either have the same or you do not. So it's one in 365. But then it becomes cumulative because now you've said two, so now that chances of the next person saying the same is now 2 and 365, right? And it starts to accumulate all the way up. And these are all over the place, and you actually get to 50%. So does that mean, when I've just done this experiment just now twice, we didn't get even get to the sec past the second row, and it's already happened, well, three times now, right? Three times. It's pretty impressive. This does not mean that this experiment was rigorous in any means. It just means that statistics fooled us, and we weren't expecting that outcome. But that doesn't mean that I can now get up and say that every pretty much everybody in the world will have a birth like 10% with the population, right? Absolutely not. And this is very important. This happens a lot, a real lot in science. You have to try and find faults. And this is really tricky because a lot of the time you spend a lot of money and you have a reason that you've done an experiment. And you want to make sure that you're, like, you're going to gain something from doing it. Otherwise, you would never do it. So here's something that I've been working on with Christian and Maxwell and Matt Perger and whoever else is involved in this collaboration um, is grinding profiles, right? I care a lot about grinding physics. Grinders are really cool. They take something big and they turn them into something small. And that, everyone's seen this sort of data before. So this is not Matt's data. This is actually in Kelowna and Smalls. We had to close the shop for one day and we brought in a laser particle size analyzer into the store and we did a whole bunch of experiments in the shop. And the idea was is that we're going to try and understand what uh, that day we were looking at what temperature does to the, to the bean. So if, uh, sorry, to the grind profile. So if I cooled down the bean and then measured the grind profile with everything else the same, does the fracturing patterns differ? That's not what I'm presenting today. What I'm presenting today is an analysis of data. So here's a reproducible data set. So I take the same coffee, Las Illusions. Where's that from? El Salvador. Yeah, so this is this year's. Uh, and I put it through an EK, 43, set it a grinder, grind whatever it was, 2.7, it doesn't matter. Okay, and I get these two data sets, and they look pretty good, right? Okay, there's some minor differences here, and this is deviated a little bit here, and it looks pretty good. But you know what's funny about this? That this is volume percent. And if you think of volume percent, of something that's really large takes up a lot of volume, and something that's really small does not. And what matters in coffee is surface area. So if we look at this, if we convert this to surface area, assuming a sphere, which is not a bad assumption to make, what's going on here? It, you may be able to see that this red line for volume percent has a very, very tiny bump. 
But these particles are very small. And so they contribute a huge amount to surface area. And now this starts to become significant because this black line here has this nice bimodal thing. And this red line, you would never know, but in surface area, is trimodal. Okay. Now let's turn this same interpretation into counts, so total numbers of particles. So if we sh sent this through the laser and just said how many of particle size 1 are there versus how many of particle size 100 and so on. And things start to get uh, really skewed now. This is the same, same data again. Now this dotted line now is surface area, uh, sorry, is uh, total counts. So the black line, now those boulders that everyone's, uh, everyone sees right here have disappeared almost entirely because there's not very many of them. In fact, I can quantify it for you. For every particle that's of size, well, let's say that's about 2 uh, micron on the uh, logarithmic scale. For every one of these, there's 100 trillion, uh, sorry, excuse me. For every one of these, there's 100 trillion of those. OK? We're talking large orders of magnitude difference here. And this makes a really big difference for this data set, because now all of a sudden, that red one that had that bimodal bump and that tiny little hip right there goes off the scale in terms of number of counts. What does this mean? Does this mean, so let's, let's zoom out a bit. And this was the good data, the one that was monomodal here. And you've got, that's your counts, that's your surface area, and that's your volume percent. And this is the bad one that we were looking at. And this is your volume percent, your surface area, and your counts that goes off the scale. The top one is not, that's not what actually happened. That is an error in either the grinder, I highly doubt it, or an error in the measurement. But if you were to simply present these and take an average and then present this as a data set, this would include this outlier. And this outlier is really, really bad because it's not representative of the grind at all. Right? These, these shots would taste identical. And it's not because of magic. It's because this is simply an error in the, in the measurement. And you would never have seen it if I didn't reinterpret it. To make matters more confusing, uh, Christian, are you in this room? Yeah, there you are. So we got two EKs in Max's shop. Uh, there, now, truth be told, the blue one is, he's got a different dial on the blue line than he did on the black line. So they're not directly comparable in terms of the, w what size they're producing. And you can see that here, right? So the boulders are definitely shifting. So the black one somehow is actually finer in the boulders, yet more coarse here. So in their brew bar, Max uh, was producing uh, this, so for filter coffee. And he couldn't really make an espresso with this. Uh, is that what happened? OK, so the black line was better, right? Uh, you can conclude what you want from that, but the point is that the same piece of equipment. So two EKs don't produce the same grind profile, but it's, it's significantly different. So even if you thought you were doing the right thing, so I didn't show you the volume percentage on this one, but the volume percentage almost directly overlay again. right? And this very, these are very, very different. Uh, so that, that's really important. And I guess the, the, the really the drive home message that I want to talk to you about is that there's no peer review in coffee. So in science, when I submit a paper that I've worked on for a while, and I want you guys to like accept this paper. So this, we, I did this coffee paper with Max a while ago. And when we send that to review, it goes out to specialists who are competing against you for a job, but they don't care about your data, right? They're just working at university. And the idea is that those same people will help you make that paper better to help you understand your data in a different way, perhaps. Or maybe they'll just straight up accept the paper. You've done a great job. Here you go. That never happens in coffee. I can't remember the last time that someone was forthcoming with all of their data on the, and let you analyze it before you, pot, you know, purchase their product. Right? That never happens. No one ever does that. So you walk in kind of blind. You walk in thinking, somebody has told me that this grinder that actively heats is better than this grinder that does, that does not. But I don't know why that is. Somebody said it makes, it makes a tasty shot. Now, that could be true. I will not discount that it makes a tasty shot. That is not the point. The point is, is that they tell you it, makes a better, it produces a better product because of this thing that they've implemented. Why? I don't know. Send that out to peer review and get people to tell you that that is or is not the case as to what it's actually doing. Now, we know the answer to that. I'm not presenting on that today. Uh, but the point is, is that there's a conflict of interest all the time because a business in coffee is trying to make money. And you guys who own shops and stuff, they, you have to buy equipment from people. Or you have to try and progress as a roaster, if you like, by understanding all the variables and understanding what's the best investment. And it's really tough, because no one else is there to help you out. So I actually, 
I'm coming to the end of this talk, but I had an idea, right? So I'm always learning in, in coffee, and I was sitting there, and I had this idea, because you guys are really good at doing experiments, so I had this idea I wanted to do a big experiment. And I was sitting there, I described it to Scott uh, over lunch just now, and Scott told me that there was many things that I could have done better. So I've revised all of this. These next slides are totally new. We're doing something totally different. Uh, the idea that we had was that it's quite frequent that you'll have in your shop a Kenyan coffee and an Ethiopian coffee at some point in time at the, in the same, at the same moment. And I'm interested to see the difference in extraction between the Kenyan and the Ethiopian. Right? I want to know, they, I mean, those countries are very close together. I want to know why, why is there such a difference? It's, it's irrelevant as to what the difference actually is, but we want to know if people are extracting more or less with the same recipe from a Kenyan coffee versus an Ethiopian coffee. So the idea is straightforward. So if you have in your shop an Ethiopian coffee and a Kenyan coffee at the same time, or in your house, it doesn't matter if you've got the equipment for this, uh, dial in one. Make one taste good. Right? It doesn't matter which one you pick. You dial in the Kenyan or you dial in the Ethiopian, it makes no difference. And whatever recipe you used for the Kenyan or the Ethiopian that's dialed in, use exactly the same recipe. Don't change anything. Don't change the grinder setting. Don't change the water mass. Don't change the coffee mass or the temperature. Don't do anything different and brew the coffee exactly the same way. And then what we want you to do is to measure the extraction with a refractometer and all, all that's it. That's all you need to do, right? And maybe you can start seeing some correlations yourself as, a, as your own experimentalist, but what I've set up a, spread, a sheet online, like a Google form, and all you have to do is, for me, this would be amazing, is to enter your, your email address where you are. These aren't important, right? You don't have to do this. Uh, that shouldn't have a star. I'll fix that. It's, uh, yeah, you're going to enter it for the Ethiopian coffee, so you just say where it's from. Uh, the Kenyan coffee, where it's from, which brew method you used, uh, the mass of the coffee you used, the mass of the water, and then the refractometer reading, this is the really important one, for the Ethiopian versus the Kenyan. Okay? And the idea is that I've got a lot of people in this room, and if I get, as Scott mentioned, a thousand data sets, so a thousand points along this curve, so that if this goes for two years, it goes for two years. But in two years' time, we have a thousand points, and we can conclude, per perhaps, that you can extract more from Ethiopian coffee with exactly the same recipe than you can from Kenyan coffee. That sheds light on lots of things. It sheds lights on how we, how we roast the coffee, so perhaps it's easier or more, more challenging to roast one or the other. We have to, I then have to interface with roasters to try and interpret this data, right? It's going to be a lot of data. Or it sheds light on how people are brewing coffee. Perhaps the one you dial it into, if you say, I, I'll put a tick box as to which one you dialed it into, if you dial into the Ethiopian coffee and it's consistently higher than the uh, people who have dialed into Kenyan coffee, that's really interesting as well. Right? So there's lots of things we can include from this. Now, how do you get to this form? Uh, visit my website, and it's called The Coffee Experiment. Now, my website, if you look for my name, you'll find it. It's a, it's a hipster website that's made with bootstrap. Which means if you, get in, if you go to the website on a computer, it looks like this. Unless your screen's a little smaller, then it might look like this. So then it's over there. And then if you go on a phone, it looks like this. So, so then it's there. OK. But the point is, I want you to partake in it. If you, if you have a better idea, I would love to hear it. Because this is, the, this is what I do for a job. I love to interpret data. And if you have data and you have problems with uh, understanding what it's meaning, or if, if you want to design an experiment, also get in touch. If you don't want to talk to me because I don't know enough about coffee, for instance, send Maxwell an email. He's happy to help. He'll probably interface with me. We're happy to help you with experimental stuff. Uh, with that, I'm open to uh, certainly criticism, but also I'd love to take some questions and some comments on this talk. Thank you. So we have uh, time for a few questions. Anybody? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really interesting question. I got asked, so the answer is yes, in the next few months, def definitely. Uh, I got asked a question as to whether I should go into just doing research in coffee full stop, because I don't, I don't work in coffee, right? I work in semiconductors. Uh, and I've thought about it, and I'd much prefer, I think kind of the thing that keeps me different from other people who do research in coffee is that I don't have any business interest in it at all. Right? I just want everybody else to make better coffee. So for me, I, it's better if I don't ever go into coffee properly, because then I never have to make money out of it. 
right? So the like the the book that we published that that is to, it's a learning tool and it's written like a learning tool and I, we don't try and make money off of that. You know, it's just it, that's how much it costs. You know, and with the with the papers, I try and make them free for everybody to read. So as long as I can do that, that's much. That's what I would prefer to do. Yeah. Well. Yeah, so we tried to, uh, I mean, it's a good point. We tried to sort of, I guess. Like TikToks. Yeah, well, we, we tried to include that into what we were, what, in, the pro, in the idea of dialing your coffee into taste good. It's sort of, if you can make it taste good with a conical grinder, good. Right, if it tastes good with a, a flat burr grinder, that's also good. And I, if I make a tick box, then I have to somehow start to interpret which one was better data. I don't want to do that. So I, that's, I'm sure there's a personal preference there, and I don't, I don't know. Yeah, but it's a, good, it's a good point. I can put a tick box for you if you'd like. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much, Chris. You're welcome.